subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. It's the 15th of June, important and interesting for many reasons, not the least of which is the fact that this is President Xi Jinping's birthday. So happy 68th President Xi Jinping. Uh, but that is not the reason we are doing this episode of Katta Clutter because usually there is no clutter about somebody's birthday. They might be in a very rare case, but Xi Jinping is not one of those. So once again, happy birthday. It's also the first anniversary of the clash in Galwan. That is where India said 20 of its soldiers died mostly from Bihar regiment but also from artillery, Punjab, couple of other regiments also. Those soldiers were duly acknowledged and honoured. The Chinese on the other hand much later said that four of their soldiers died and thereby hangs some, some mystery because the Chinese said four but nobody in the world believes that number because nobody in the world believes very much that comes out of China anyway, particularly the numbers. And also many in China have raised questions about this and there's been a crackdown from the Chinese. We know that they, they've gone after bloggers, social media, people active on social media who question these numbers and now the Chinese have even passed a very draconian law uh, criminalizing any criticism of their armed forces. So that is one side of the picture. The second part of the picture is tactical. The tactical is where are the Chinese today, where is where are the Indian troops today. So once again that on that there isn't such a division between say India and China. India and China talk about disengagement and also de-escalation. Disengagement means wherever soldiers are sitting in areas where they should not normally be sitting. Uh, they are too close to each other, they should disengage, but de-escalation also means that they should pull back the larger units that they that they are now they have now taken up, even if they are sitting in depth. That can be tanks, artillery, missiles, whatever. So those things are going on. Now on the Indian side, in the Indian uh, debate, there is a divide. There is a divide among those who think that India has pretty much achieved whatever it wanted to tactically or territorially uh, with the PLA. The rest is a question of people, troops sitting too close together or not allowing each other to patrol. That, will, that can wait for a long time, it's all right. There is also the other school that says, no, the Chinese have achieved whatever they'd set out to achieve, particularly denying India the large depth sank planes, which are quite crucial for the defense of Dalat Bay Goldi, but also as, as a route of ingress for India towards the big Chinese uh, highway, the Sinkiang Tibet highway. Nevertheless, we don't know too much about that and the satellite imagery right now doesn't tell us very much, at least the satellite imagery that's available to us. But the important thing is, it is only a tactical issue. Because what were the Chinese doing? Now everybody agrees that whatever Chinese did last year, they started it, India did not start it. When they started it last year, say in a what, about April of last year as the snows began to melt, they were not making a tactical move. They were making a strategic move. Now a tactical move is take a little territory here, take that mountain there, take this pass here, deny somebody access to these plains, that pass, that is tactical. Strategic is that by coming up here, <coughs> I'm threatening you. Because I'm threatening you and I'm a bigger power, you then have to bring in all your bandobast. So you have to, first of all, I throw your military posture off balance. What that means is, if you had, say, X number of divisions facing Pakistan in Y theater, you have to now have those divisions from that theater and shift them here. Similarly, now you can't take me lightly in all the other sections of the frontier where you change your uh, where you share your border with me so you have to move your troops up there so i upset your military balance i throw you off balance okay i would still say that is the local strategic level the third can be that i want you the chinese point point of view i want you to take the heat of my ally 
Pakistan. So that can be Xi Jinping's strategic objective, possibly. Also, because Xi Jinping knew and the Chinese knew, everybody knew that the Afghan situation was coming up for a denouement, Trump or no Trump, because Trump was committed to withdrawing his troops even earlier, dumping Afghans to their fortune and the Pakistanis. And the Chinese have big investments in the zone abutting Afghanistan, Afghan border, in a very fragile area, the CPEC. So the Chinese want a friendly dispensation in Afghanistan, which can only be, by implication, a Pakistan-friendly or a Pakistan-controlled dispensation. So this may have been a way of telling India to get off Pakistan's back. All of this is possible. How much of it's been achieved? We will know as time passes. I will, however, say that this is still at a larger tactical level or at local strategic level. What is the picture one year from Galwan in the global strategic level? How has that shifted? Now, it is not my argument that the global situation has changed because the Chinese moved into or Chinese began to push us around or being or rudely knocking at our doors or sitting on dharna on territory we consider our own in eastern Ladakh. That, but important thing is, while that may not have set off this geopolitical change or geostrategic change across the world and actually shaken the power balance in the world, but it was of the most visible and the most dangerous and the most profound new manifestation and symptom of a new muscular approach that the China had begun to take militarily and strategically in its neighborhood, that's with Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan, uh, everybody uh, in its closer neighborhood and also with its strongest land neighbor. I'm not counting Russia there because with Russia, now, China has very friendly re relationship and we'll talk about that as we go along. So, this is what made the whole world wake up. That is the Chinese now, besides doing the putter putter that they were doing in South China Sea, dumping some sand here, some sand there, conjuring up new islands, putting an airstrip, then claiming all the area around there, or threatening Taiwan, but they've been threatening Taiwan for a very long time. This time, they had shown the intent of actually risk a military confrontation with a fellow nuclear weapons power that is India and the world knows that India was not going to be a pushover was not going to withdraw or leave them whatever they wanted or sign on the dotted line that wasn't going to happen so this was then seen globally as a big statement of intent by the Chinese so what has happened now 15th of June, I told you, Xi Jinping's birthday, Galwan anniversary. It's also the day that we have seen the big NATO statement. So two things have happened in the last three days, uh, two and a half days in fact. One is the G7 summit at Cornwall in England. Uh, now Cornwall, G7 are the seven rich democracies in the world. That's America, Canada, Britain, Germany, France, Italy and Japan and then it has a bunch of invitees or guests India is among them these are all democracies now they issued a statement at the end of their meeting a 25 page statement and then the following day at Brussels many of the same leaders met at the NATO summit Joe Biden was present at both of these and NATO also issued a long joint statement so these two statements are very important and these reflect the geostrategic change one year after Galwan. Once again, I'm not saying these have been caused by Galwan or only by Galwan, but this is one year after Galwan. The picture, the global balance of power has shifted and it has shifted in a way that, uh, that you can say using Chinese language that this has shifted in a way that displays many Chinese characteristics or many Chinese influenced characteristics because you can see that the world is now seeing China as the other pole. China is now the second superpower. You cannot deny that China is the second superpower without a doubt. Now, both statements are very careful. The, the first statement, the G7 statement actually is more careful, but it still leaves nothing to chance. It talks about usual human rights, rule of law, internet freedom, uh, 
controls on hate speech, fundamental freedoms, free expressions, uh, some of which have caused comment and concern on the Indian side, as it should, because some of our response to internet freedoms, etc., internet shutdowns in India has been quite bad. But let's not, let me not digress there. Now, the G7 statement talks about shared values, open societies, and then comes the sting. And it's a more than a double sting. It talks about the need to honor, restore and honor and maintain the autonomy of Hong Kong. That's a hot button issue for China. It also talks about free and open Indo-Pacific. Again, the Chinese knew what that means in English language. Third, it talks about the freedom of the Taiwan Strait. Once again, the Chinese know what that means in Chinese language and in their, in their own language. So these G7 have made these very clear references and we have seen from international media that it does look like a couple of the European countries were a little bit shy of getting into it because everybody has their own fish to fry with China. Plus, China is a big daddy. Do you really want pangas with China or not? And you know that the Chinese have no sense of humor about these things. You can't sign this and then quietly go to the Chinese and say, boss, don't take it too seriously. I didn't mean it. It doesn't work like that. So these are the important things that have happened. Uh, next, if you come to the NATO statement. Now, there was an expectation that the NATO statement, statement will be tougher on China. So I read it very carefully and I was reading it. It looked, looked like they had completely given the China a pass. In fact, Several of the paras early on in the NATO statement talked about Russia as if Russia was still the preeminent challenge to them in their part of the world, which may be the case because it is Russia that's pushing at Ukraine on the one side, Georgia on the other, backing the Belarusian dictator and all European countries have concerns about that. So that is their, but that, that is their local or regional strategic problem. In, pa in para 55, the NATO statement also comes to China. And it says that China's stated ambitions and assertive behavior present systematic challenges to rules-based international order and to areas relevant to NATO security. Now that's important, the drawing the connection, the China's behavior and China's assertion wherever with NATO's security. Then it goes on to underline the fact that China is now cooperating militarily with Russia. Then it also goes on to say that in areas of space, cyber, maritime issues, all these domains, China should behave like a responsible global power and not the bully that it is right now being. Not the bully is not words there. Uh, I'm adding that. And then it says that we are concerned about the fact that China is opaque it has to give up its opaqueness and also it has to stop using disinformation. So both these statements are harsh on China. Both these statements also tell you that a lot of the world is now looking at China as trouble and also realigning the forces there. And all of this, in a way, is something that India looks at very seriously. Now with this, also see the interview that Vladimir Putin has done with NBC. He doesn't give these interviews to Western media that often, but when he does, he speaks quite candidly. In that interview, the interviewer has pushed their hardest to get him to say something about Chinese military, about Chinese military buildup, about a threat from China, and he continues to say the Chinese the Chinese-Russian relationship at un, is at un, unprecedentedly positive or high levels. He also says that China is no threat to Russia. So once again, that is something that India has to note. So what has happened? One year after Galwan, you find a lot of the democratic world right now worrying about China and very cagely, carefully, but yet firmly stating its intent and combining their effort. I'm not using forces because that sounds like military, but combining all their efforts and their abilities to balance China. Having said that, one thing I need to underline, that it is very short-sighted to say a new Cold War is building up. And I got an answer to this. This was a question brewing in my mind also, that why is this not the new Cold War? And then I saw this bunch of tweets by this foremost expert at Rand Corporation. 
Rand Corporation, as we know, is a very right of center think tank in America. And he made very good points, and I'm sharing this with you. He made a very good point in particular. It's a string of tweets, but the central point is that the Cold War was different. The Cold War that started after the Second World War, that meant the essential part was that only one of the two systems will survive. That either the Soviet and communist system will be destroyed, or the American-led capitalist system will be destroyed. Only one system can survive. And ultimately, it ended like that in 1989, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Warsaw Pact collapsed. This is not that kind of Cold War, because even the rest of the world does not want China to collapse. It is not working for China to collapse. We do know that Donald Trump, uh, Mike Pompeo earlier had said that unless there is the end of the CPC, China, Communist Party of China, uh, there can be no peace with China. China will continue to be a nuisance state. But I do not believe at this point that that is the view of the rest of the world. This is not a Cold War in the sense of either, either side wanting the other disintegrating and dying. So to sum up, uh, today there is tension. Uh, there are two camps. There are two superpowers. There are two camps led by two superpowers, but neither side has as its objective the idea that the other one should just disintegrate and die as a geostrategic entity.